G'day and welcome to Redriven. Now in music, there's this thing called second album syndrome. It's where, it was where an artist releases a really successful first album, but then sort of fails to back it up with their next album. While we're talking about music, Adam, like I'm here to watch a Mazda 3 video, not listen to you harp on about music. That's a really good point. You make a valid point there. Here's the thing, but the generation of Mazda 3 before this one was kind of Mazda's first big successful album. It actually, if anything, the reason that Mazda are absolutely killing it at the moment can be largely you know, thanks to that first generation of Mazda 3. And that then begs the question, is this generation of Mazda 3 kind of representative of that underwhelming follow-up album? Like, are these actually any good? Are they underwhelming or are they actually worthy of your consideration? Like, what actually goes wrong with them? What do they cost to own and operate? What do they like to live with on a daily basis? But most importantly, should you buy one? Let's find out. Now guys, even though in this video we're going to be focusing on the Australian variants of the BL Mazda 3, no matter where you're watching this from, everything that we're going to be going over, it should relate to Mazda 3s in your local market. I should also mention in this video, we're not going to be focusing on the Mazda 3 MPS or the Mazda Speed 3 at all. Those things are so special, they deserve their own video. Actually, in saying that, if you happen to own a Mazda 3 MPS and you're located in Sydney or Newcastle or somewhere nearby and you'd be happy for us to review it on Redriven, can you let us know in the comments or on Instagram messages because we would love to feature one. Now, unlike many of this car's competitors, making sense of all the variants and the upgrades is actually pretty easy. This BL generation existed from 2009 to 2013. It has been available as a hatch or a sedan across primarily four trim specs from the base variant Neo through to our test car, the top spec SP25. Engine-wise, all but the SP25 received a 2.0-litre petrol engine, while the SP25 gets a larger and more powerful 2.5-litre power plant, while the 2.2-litre turbo diesel was also introduced during the life cycle. Speaking of the life cycles... The Mazda 3 firstly received a minor revision in 2010, then a more substantial update called the Series 2 later in 2011, featuring a revised range with the introduction of a new SP20 Sky Active variant, subtle cosmetic changes, updates to the features and tech, and improved fuel economy. Then finally, another minor revision in September of 2012. Now look, we could delve deeply into what each variant and upgrade receives, but let's be honest, it would just get so incredibly boring. So instead of doing it in this video, we have grabbed all of that information, and we've jam-packed it in our awesome and completely free Redriven Cheat Sheets. Our cheat sheets are invaluable as they provide a full breakdown of the car's model range, its common problems, what you need to look out for before handing over your hard-earned cash, how much of that cash you should be handing over, and so much more. Check it out at redriven.com or in the link below. Now guys, we really want Redriven to be like a community platform for used car advice. So we generally find it's those that own these cars that are the true experts. So if you own one of these and you've noticed in this video that you know we've missed something major, let us know in the comments. Okay, so how's the exterior? Well look, in terms of the looks, I'm not so sure. Like these kind of big headlights and this big grill down here, it just kind of looks like a, like a big goofy smile, like like the, the darker colors in, in black, they tend to hide the, you know, the enormous grille and like the SP25 models or any of the models fitted with you know, larger alloy wheels or a bit of a body kit, they do add some much needed aggression. But these things in like a lower model with the smaller wheels and especially in white can look a bit underwhelming. But in saying that, I do feel that these sedan variants, they don't look anywhere near as like as ungainly as say the Focus and the Corolla sedan alternative. So that's a good thing. Now we're gonna be covering the common faults and problems with the exterior in a little bit, but look, it's really important. There's a, there's a bunch of stuff you need to go over before you look at handing your cash over for one of these things. And hence why we've made the ultimate used car buyer's guide. The link is just up here and also in the description below. We cannot emphasize this enough. Please watch that video before you hand over your hard earned cash, because honestly, it could save you thousands of dollars. Okay, so how's the interior? Well, look, the way the interior feels is gonna vary depending on the year and the trim spec of the car because the materials used, they did change during the life cycle of the car and the variants used. But from a design aspect, it's bloody lovely. It's got this kind of like two-tier effect. So you've got this whole section up here above the center console, but then it sort of swoops down. And I love that this whole center console section kind of integrates into the dashboard really nicely. Then you've got this like this highlight of these dials, which are kind of inspired by a sports car. Design-wise, Excellent. Like in saying that, you can tell it's aging, but it's aging really gracefully. It's kind of like the, it's like the Helen Mirren of car interiors. Ergonomics wise, spot on. This driving position, 
This is about as close to perfect as a driving position can get for a car in this particular category. Everything is really easy to touch and get to. It just it feels like a really nice place, very involving place to sit. But in this particular car, wear and tear is interesting. So we're losing some paint here on the uh, on the plastic handles there. The steering wheel is ultra shiny. That might be able to be restored, not sure. But then on the dash, there's like, it's cop some abuse here and then there's sort of scratches on top of the dash. Now, if those scratches on top of the dash are because someone's been putting their feet on there, putting your feet in front of an airbag is a pretty silly thing to do. It's a really good way to force your kneecaps through your brain. So yeah, if there's an airbag on that side, don't put your feet up there. Even as far as the seats go, leather, it's getting a little bit harsh, but again, that can all be restored quite nicely. The center console section here, like the paint's looking really good. There's no kind of scratches or anything. Wear and tear's interesting. Also on the wear and tear, we've just noticed that the glove box is kind of almost looks like it's falling off, and there's some chunks out of the air conditioning vent, or the surround around the air conditioning vent. Look, obviously the levels of wear and tear, they're gonna vary depending on you know the age of the car and who owns it. This particular car is this gentleman's everyday driver. It doesn't get abused, but it's, it's clearly used. Now, referring back to iconic second albums in the back seat, I'm exactly 15.16 Rage Against the Machine Evil Empires tall. This is in my driving position, and it's okay, like my knees are rubbing up against the back of the seat. There's an okay amount of foot room. The actual seats are really, really comfortable, but it's, yeah, it's not too bad. And like materials wise, it's like the front, there's some hard scratchy plastics here and then some soft squidgy bits all over the place. It's not too bad. As far as wear and tear goes, quite nice. Like the leather's still quite soft. Leather here feels nice. There's not too many scratches. The back seats clearly do get used, but not a whole lot. Okay, so how's the tech? Well, look, with the age of this car, you can forget about any kind of phone connectivity like Apple CarPlay or Android Auto. And the problem is because this isn't like a standard double DIN head unit size, even upgrading this to like Apple CarPlay or Android Auto can be a bit of a pain in the ass. It can be done, it's possible, but it's just a bit of a pain. But what tech these will have, it'll depend on the year and trim spec. For example, a base spec Neo from 2009 will feature a six speaker sound system with a CD player, auxiliary inputs, air conditioning, remote central locking, a 12 volt power outlet, a trip computer, and an immobilizer. But get yourself into a top spec SP25 from say 2013 and you can expect a 10 speaker sound system with Bluetooth connectivity, satellite navigation via a 4.1 inch display, leather seats, bi-xenon headlights with washers, automatic headlights, rain sensing wipers, a proximity key and a power operated sunroof. To decipher which Mazda 3 gets what levels of tech, just jump on redriven.com and check out that sheet sheet and we've also, we've put the link in the description down there somewhere. Okay, so is it practical? Well, look, in the boot, look, this is a really big boot, especially for the size of this car, and the hatchbacks are even larger again, sort of. What I mean is that the aperture in the hatchback is bigger. The problem with this, the aperture is quite small, and there's a bit of a load lip here as well, so getting things in and out that are heavy is a bit of a pain in the ass. Also, and correct me if I'm wrong here, we can't seem to find a way that you can actually get into the boot from the outside of the car without the key. Obviously, there's a latch in the car, and you can use this, but there's no button, there's no little... Yeah, there's no latch on the boot to get in. Is that the case, Mazda 3 owners? Can you get in without the key from outside? In practicality, in the second row, you have an armrest with two cup holders there. You've got a re-driven script holder behind the passenger seat. And you've got door bins, which are actually quite large, and they're also really easy to get things in and out of, even when the doors are closed. And practicality, in the front seat, you've got a spot for sunglasses up here. What does he wear? The owner of this car wears French Connection. Quite stylish. Well done. Um, I don't break them, they're good. Uh, there's a spot down here, there's a power outlet there. It actually clearly says no smoking. Well done, Mazda. Smoking's gross. Uh, the cubby hole hiding two cup holders here. It's good with all everything with a cover on it, so it just makes the design all nice and sleek again. There's a spot here, there's a little tray that you can take out here, more power outlets and auxiliary input down there. Just noticed another wear and tear thing that's starting to fall apart. Good sized door bins, which will hold a re driven water bottle there. There's a nice little shelf down here for. I don't know, stuff, things, grit and grime. And that's about it, there's nothing under the seats. Oh, glove box, okay, so the glove box. That's it, decent, decent practicality. One more thing with the interior and kind of practicality is that the gap on the seats between the actual horizontal part and the vertical part, the gap is really big. So if you put your phone on the seat or really anything kind of thinner than that and you accelerate, it's just gonna slide back into the floor of the rear seat. That's a pain in the neck. 
Okay, what goes wrong? Well, firstly, the boot release mechanism. It's, it's not a common problem, but there are reports of it failing, either it won't close or won't open properly. But even if it does go bad, it's a pretty easy fix. Next up, make sure that anything controlled by electricity actually works. We're talking, you know, power mirrors, power windows, because there have been a couple of reports that some of the power windows can fail to go up and down. Now, we have read online that the easiest way of fixing this is just by keeping your finger on the down button of the power window control. That kind of resets the computer and does fix it. Some owners are reporting that their headlights can fog up from the inside, much like my brain. Okay, problems inside in the first one, this car is guilty of, there are many reports that the dashboard can get sticky. Now the problem is, cars that are exposed to you know heat and the harsh outdoors, which Australia is renowned for, that happens. In really the worst case scenarios, it can even give off like a plastic or plasticky or chemical smell, but this, ugh, it's gross, yuck. Now in hatchbacks, there are a few reports that there can be rattles coming from the tailgate. It's generally the rear brake light not being fitted properly or just, you know, being fitted incorrectly. Yeah, like a faulty fitment. Um, pretty easy to fix. Now before we get into mechanically what can go wrong with the Mazda 3, look, we love making these videos for you guys, but the only way we can keep making them is with your support. And the best way to support us is just simply by hitting the like and subscribe and bell buttons and just sharing the content as much as you can. That'd be awesome. Okay, mechanically, what goes wrong with this generation of Mazda 3? Look, I would love to tell you, but I can't because I'm not a qualified mechanic, but Jim is. My job this week is actually pretty easy because the Mazda 3, in terms of reliability, is right up there, although they're not perfect. I'll talk about the diesels first. Look, their most serious problem, and it's a big one, is their turbo setup. They're a twin turbo, and when they fail, and they do fail, it's eye-wateringly expensive to repair. We're talking thousands and thousands of dollars. They do also have a few EGR and DPF complications, but you can mitigate the risk of those issues by looking after it. That means doing the services on time and with the right oil. And on time is at least every 10,000 Ks, and the right oil is a full synthetic 530, which is suitable for DPF applications. And a fun fact, here in Australia, the Mazda 3 diesel only represented 3% of all of them sold, which you've got to wonder in the future, how's that going to go with the cost of repairs and the availability of parts? The petrol engines, all of them, they're all good. Uh, they have no real major, like one big problem that costs thousands and thousands. The most common problem we see in the workshop is replacing this, the front engine mount. Now this is a hydraulically cushioned mount and when it fails, it just makes a terrible harshness through the whole car, which is worse at idle. And when you change that, it just transforms everything. It's not expensive, it only costs a few hundred bucks to fix. Some of the earlier ones had randomly failing camshaft drive gears, but it definitely wasn't common. And other than that, it's really just the odd coil pack or water pump, which is pretty much the same as all modern day cars. Now, as Adam alluded to, we are gonna cover the MPS models in a later video. Okay, so is it safe? Well, look, the Mazda 3 received a perfect five star safety rating from its launch back in 2009, and it actually retained that perfect five stars all the way through its life cycle because Mazda updated the safety as the car progressed through its life cycle. But to give you an idea of what safety features the Mazda 3 actually comes with, I'm gonna do another voiceover, but this time, I'm gonna do it like, like an airline pilot speaking to his passengers. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. This is your captain speaking, and welcome aboard the Mazda 3 safety features. As you'll notice, we are currently driving at a very legal 60 kilometers an hour through Sydney streets, but if we do have to perform any evasive maneuvers, the anti-lock brakes, electronic brake force distribution, electronic traction control, brake assist, and electronic stability control will instantly intervene, most likely saving all of our lives. Now, ladies and gentlemen, if we do happen to run into any turbulence, like for example, a tree, a building, or an oncoming car, a number of airbags will deploy in front and around you while the active front seat head restraints and seat belts with pretensioners and load limiters will safely hold you in place. Now on behalf of our cabin and crew we'd like to thank you for driving with us here in the Mazda 3. Now sit back, relax and enjoy the rest of the video. Good morning. Now, which Mazda 3 receives what safety equipment is pretty consistent across the entire range, but there are a couple of variables. But for the details, again, just jump on redriven.com and check out that cheat sheet. So what's it like to drive? Well look, Mazda's tagline for ages has been zoom zoom. And even when used, that's where this car has, has the edge over its competition. This thing, it's just, it's so enjoyable to drive all of the time. Like it's no performance car by any means, but it, you, you feel connected to it. Like you feel a part of the equation all the time. Like everything's so responsive, it just, it feels right. 
And this one, which is an SP25, I feel like it's the perfect compromise between like the more performance focused, almost hot hatches and just general commuter cars. It's such a lovely balance, so impressive. But while it is fun to drive and it actually does feel kind of quick, how about we do some actual performance times? So we're gonna do a zero to 60 kilometer an hour time and a 60 to 100 kilometer an hour time. As far as living with it on a daily basis, look, it's great. Like the vision out of it's fine. A-pillars are a little bit big, so you can get a little bit of a blind spot there. And obviously there's a bit of a blind spot over your, your left or your shoulder, but that's the same in pretty much every car. This car doesn't have a reversing camera, but even then reversing it is kind of a breeze. It's easy. Like even in terms of the ride and handling, look, a lot of cars in this sort of age and this many kilometers on them, they, the suspension can get either a bit doughy or you kind of tend to go a bit harsh. This thing sort of has everything sorted. Like it's got good body control. It feels nice to go through some corners, but it's still comfy. There's no creaks, no groans, no weird noises. It just feels so bloody sorted. Look, as far as negatives go, there are plenty of people that complain about excessive road and tire noise in these things. And look, yeah, I know what they're talking about. There is a lot of road and tire noise in this car. Uh, you either get used to it or you just end up with tinnitus and then you can't hear it at all anyway. Also, there are a few little, you know, odd rattles and squeaks here and there, but you know, this many Ks on it, this many years old, that's to be expected. Look, overall, what's it like to drive? Especially in the SP25 trim, this is such an enormously underrated car. I can't say this enough, it is genuinely enjoyable to drive, yet it's just easy to live with on a daily basis. If you need something to go from A to B, but you enjoy driving, but you don't want to buy like a hot hatch or an actual performance car, this is great. Pricing here in Australia kicks off from about $5,000, but you know, a $5,000 Mazda 3 is going to be pretty rough. At the other end of the spectrum, some people are asking up to $20,000 for these things. I'm not talking about the MPS models, just an SP25 for 20 grand. Look, I know the used car market is inflated at the, at the moment. I just, I don't know how many are actually selling for 20,000 bucks. It just seems a bit steep. Something like this, which is a 2012 SP25 in you know, pretty decent condition with a reasonable amount of kilometers on it. Even these are asking around about 18,000 bucks. How many are swapping hands for $18,000? I'm not sure, but yeah, 18 grand seems expensive. Oh, and for pricing internationally, here's a graphic. Mazda claims a fuel consumption figure that ranges from 5.7 litres per 100 k's for like the diesel models through to 8.7 litres per 100 k's for these SP25s. But this one's actually seeing 10 litres per 100 k's. Mazda offered a three year unlimited kilometre warranty on all of these Mazda 3s, which means unless you've got a time machine, these are all well and truly out of warranty now. Mazda also recommends servicing every six months or 10,000 Ks, but don't feel like you've got to take it to an actual Mazda dealership. Just do your homework and find a reputable mechanic, like an independent mechanic, because you know you should support the little guys. Okay, so should you buy one? Yep, yes you should. When it comes to this category of car, the Mazda 3, along with the Toyota Corolla, the Hyundai i30 and Honda Civic are our go-to picks. But while the Mazda 3 certainly isn't perfect, it offers an arguably more enjoyable driving experience over the other three. And when they're all so incredibly closely matched, if you enjoy driving, it's this aspect that sets it apart. Our sweet spot of the range is actually this, the SP25. Like, yes, it's a little bit thirsty that it's two litre siblings, but the extra power and torque just make for a more enjoyable drive. It's brilliant. It's those that own these that they're the most knowledgeable on the car. Oh, start again, it's just, it went way off tangent. Okay, here we go. Easy, let's make it all up. Good to go? Oh, you're already recording, I'm so sorry. <laughs> yeah. Now guys, would you buy a Mazda 3? Do you own a Mazda 3? Let us know in the comments. And remember, can you please hit those like, subscribe and bell buttons and share our content as much as possible? That'd be awesome. See you next time.